بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم جميعا Your Excellency, Dr. Hassa, esteemed guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you all as the state of Qatar embarks on this uh, ambitious strategic uh, broadband plan. Um, the objective of, of this panel, and, and thank you, Richard, for, for a wonderful, insightful presentation there. You know, we hear a lot about technology. We see a lot of innovation taking place um, day by day, uh, minute by minute, but one key challenge to, um, to address that is very important for all of us to acknowledge and, and do something about is, is how, do we, how, do we, how do we get people to adopt these technologies and innovations? What are the barriers and challenges that we all need to sort of address um, and, and, and come up with solutions? And, and, and primarily the whole aspect of change management. So we all know from, from stories and, and experiences in the past that we can, we can invest a lot of time and effort in developing state-of-the-art technologies, but if we do not invest enough time um, on, on the adoption and the change management aspects of it, there's, there's not a lot that we will actually see to flourish from the implementations of technologies. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to have a, uh, a distinguished panel, uh, three industries that are very close to my heart, technology, healthcare, and sports. Um, and without, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our, our panelists one by one. We'll start with uh, with the ladies, and ladies first. So if we can have Karis Wynn Davis join us, please. And Karis is a partner at Pinsent Mason specializing in privacy, data protection, intellectual property. She has extensive experience advising both private and public sector bodies on privacy, data protection, and intellectual property issues. She acts for a wide range of clients, including manufacturing, technology companies, defense organizations, medical device companies. She was honored to advise ICT Qatar on <coughs> and to prepare draft policy laws for Qatar. She regularly advises on privacy and data privacy compliance issues, including subject access and freedom, uh, freedom of information requests, data security incidents, including advising on and preparing notifications to the ICO and to the individuals whose personal data has been lost. Our second panelist, uh, Dr. Faleh Mohammed Hussain Ali, if you can join us, please. Dr. Farah is the Assistant for Policy to the Minister of Health and Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Health. He oversees the nationwide reforms, including the implementation of 39 projects of the 2011-2016 National Health Strategy. He leads the SDH Directorate General for Policy Affairs, which encompasses several national strategic departments, inclusive of health planning and assessment, health financing insurance, ITE health strategy, Healthcare Quality Management Medical Research National Health Strategy um, and the 2011-2016 PMO National Cancer Implementation Team. Um, most recently, he's been appointed as well as the Ch Acting Chief Executive Officer of the National Health Insurance Company. Our third panelist, uh, Mr. Vishnu Singh, if you can join us, please. Vishnu hails from Canada, where he started his career in Ericsson, followed by a brief stint in Sweden and over five years in Malaysia. Currently, Vishnu manages a team of analysts in Bangalore a global competent center for Ericsson Consumer Lab. Prior to joining Ericsson, he was in the information technology industry for five years. In his current role as head of Ericsson Consumer Labs in Bangalore, he analyzes consumer behavior and their attitude to telecom products and services. Consumer Lab aims to ensure that consumer insight is an integral part of product development, marketing, and branding at Ericsson. Mr. Khalid Al-Hashmi, if you can join us, please. Mr. Hashmi has more than 16 years of experience in the IT field with particular expertise in cybersecurity, information infrastructure, and IT, ICT systems planning. In his role as Executive Director for Cybersecurity, <coughs> excuse me, Qatar's national program that safeguards the country's information communication systems. He has been instrumental in the development of national strategy for cybersecurity, focusing first on critical, service, critical sector services within the country. Recognizing that cybersecurity is not confined to national boundaries, he has worked closely with many security teams worldwide to develop integrated response systems and a robust information network. And our last panelist, if we can have engineer Yasser al Jamal, please join us. Engineer Yasser is Qatar 2022 Supreme's Committee's Technical Program Delivery Executive Director, presiding over the planning and implementation of revolutionary state-of-the-art stadiums and cooling technologies that played such a key role in Qatar's successful build for, bid for 2022. Prior to joining the 2022 bid committee in 2009 
Engineer Yasser was a project director at Qatar EDR. Before this, Engineer Yasser worked at Qatar Petroleum, ExxonMobil, and Shell. Graduated from the University of Texas in 2000 with a degree in mechanical engineering. If we can just have a round of applause for, for our esteemed panelists here. All right, um, similar to the first panel, we want to go, go through uh, each and every one of our panelists just to give um, some introductory remarks um, related to the panel objectives on adoption and barriers. So we'll start out with Karis, please. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's a great honor to be here uh, to talk about privacy issues. Uh, first of all, I want to say that I'm here to be optimistic. Uh, often it's seen as uh, the role of privacy lawyers to stand in the way of business. Um, in fact, what I would say, taking up the, the quote from Richard at the end of his presentation, uh, the best way to predict the future for privacy uh, is indeed to invent it. So uh, let's see if we can have some ideas for that. We've heard about the, the massive benefits that um, there are with broadband, um, particularly mobile broadband. We're all going mobile. Um, it's clear that mobile is an integrator. It's bringing together all the various platforms. What is very interesting is that um, mobile is now being used less for phone calls and, and more for gathering data. Uh, with that comes big data, but with that also comes the collection of a vast amount of personal data. Uh, governments, regulators all around the world are debating this. It's a, a very hot topic, a very important topic. But what is clear is that it isn't just for governments and regulators to deal with the privacy issue. Uh, the invitation is to business and industry actually to address some of the concerns. But before we can address the concerns, I think we need to identify some of them first before we move on to the next step. So let's just think about mobile and, and the actual challenges that it brings. Well, mobile devices are with us all of the time. They're, they're very personal. They tend to be switched on all of the time as well. So there it, it has a very direct connection to us, a connection to the user. So that enables lots of people to collect a lot of data about us. So let's just have a think about um, what that data might be. Well, it tends to know where you are tends to know who you're talking to. Cameras can actually take your photographs. It tends to know what you look like, what your uh, personal choices are, what you're shopping for, where you go. And there's even been an, an app developed uh, in the UK which predicts where you're going to go. Uh, it's won an award for actually tracking somebody's uh, phone tracking where they've been, where they tend to go, uh, also their friends looking at where they tend to go. And by developing an algorithm which calculates where you are going to go, and it's found that it can predict in a group of 200 users where they will be tomorrow at a certain time within 20 meters. Um, all very frightening. So massive privacy challenges all very useful. These apps are revolutionizing our lives, but with it, they're moving very fast and taking a lot of private information. A lot of research has been done which has found that um, app developers are perhaps not fully aware of the, the issues of privacy. They're tending to take more uh, private information than they actually need to do for the particular application that uh, they're using it for. It's very dangerous to people if their, their private information is, um, <coughs> is not secure. And people are generally unaware of the fact that they are um, providing a lot of this information and it may be provided to third parties. A lot of people have access to this information. So we've got the, the manufacturers of the devices, we've got the platforms, we've got social media, we've got the app developers, the app distributors. Each one is taking a nibble at the, uh, the personal data, or perhaps a large bite, uh, and some of this is out of our control. So at the moment, it's very disintegrated, and I think that is the challenge. That is the challenge to business, to come up with a more integrated solution. 
The European Article 29 um, Working Committee, which advises the European Commission on data protection issues, um, and uh, the Federal Trade Commission have all been looking at these issues. And the same, same sort of conclusions are drawn. And I don't think they'll be a surprise to you because they're really the conclusions that are drawn with all personal data and privacy issues. We need to be uh, far more fair in the collection of data. People need to understand what's being collected and why. A great transparency, and that now is moving down to a granular level, so not just broad statements of what data is being collected and how it's being used, but specific data and specifically what it's being used for. Privacy by design, I'm sure you've all heard of this as well. This is effectively making sure when you're building your applications, you build privacy into it as part of the technology. And then unexpected uses, making sure that you actually get people's consent um, and don't assume that consent has been given. And this is where I come back to the challenge. Well, who is going to determine how you do this? Um, and the European group um, has said that all of the different people involved in the chain, uh, from the operator, the manufacturers, the app developers, the distributors, all need to get together to get a, a high level of privacy. That is very clear. They um, lean on the, the, de the device manufacturers and say perhaps they should lead the way. Uh, in the US, the position is different and they suggest the platform provider should lead the way. I think what I would say is the challenge is out there to make this integrated and to make it an issue for industry to address and going back to the quote, making the future yourselves uh, and making that a privacy compliant future. Thank you, Karis. Uh, Dr. Dr. Fadeh, if you can give us some uh, introductory remarks from uh, the SCH and healthcare perspective. Um, thank you very much. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulul Karim. Thank you, and Dr. Nonaiza, for inviting me to be amongst my favorite crowd, techies. So um, I do apologize if you don't like the, the word. Um, from the, the health perspective, the, um, as you all know, um, or the majority of you know, Qatar National Division was, was envisaged, uh, and, and, and if um, Mr. Levin allows me, I'm going to use his pyramid that he showed in the, in the morning, starting with the aspiration. The vision was the QNV uh, 2008, it was launched, and, and uh, as you know, it's, it's based, it's, its aim is to, to, um, to have an advanced society that is able to sustain its development and give its, its um, um, population, residents, uh, its people, the high standards of living, the highest standard of living possible. And so that was inspiration, that was, the, that was the vision, and from it came the next level, which was the strategy. So the National Development Strategy was launched in 2011, and from that, the um, sectorial uh, different sectors uh, developed its own vision, uh, its own strategy, um, I mean, and, and including ours, which was the 2011-2016 uh, National Health Strategy. And within that, the components that relates to, to e-health were also envisaged as part of the 39 projects. Um, so what, what does it mean then to us as far as um, data and technology is concerned? And uh, we tend to teach our students, uh, if you teach or if you talk to your, employ you know, your employees and subordinates and team um, workers, that uh, technology is not the aim, it's an enabler. And the aim out of using technology in healthcare is to get the best maximum possible benefit for the patient and, and uh, you don't have even be a patient, somebody is healthy and living. So one of the main challenges I've been finding to try to set the, the, kind of the agenda for e-health has been a uniform definition of what e-health means. I, you know, some people think it's EMR, some people think it's EHR, some people are using you know, technology to, to, um, uh, to define what um, care to the patient can be given within the hospital setting, each his own view of what it means. To me personally, and you can, you know, I can be challenged in this, I consider every electron that moves the aim of giving health care, um, you know, proper health um, um, care to, the, to, to a patient or resident of a country to be considered the health, so that the spectrum is huge from using GPS and, and, and cars defining where they are to, to you know, the, the, the nearest um, um, uh, 
vehicle to, to, to come to the closest um, um, accident uh, point, or is it um, you know, uh, mobile terminals where um, emergency uh, medical services can gain um, access to data and transmit access, so transmit data to the to provider at the end of the line, or it's using the cloud for uh, mobile information so the patient can carry its records wherever they go. And, you know, and, and as, as the latest technology that coming in, uh, an embedded chip in, the, in, in somebody's, arm, somebody's arm who's uh, the patient being diabetic, um, the chip itself has a um, um, insulin that is 1,000 times potent and it's connected to Wi-Fi to a mobile device or mobile phone, the person's mobile phone, and that mobile device transmits the information to um, a physician who can then control or regulate the blood um, uh, insulin level by sending push. It doesn't have to be, you know, even a, a provider. It could be done through um, AI. So the, the, the spectrum is so wide and varied that how do you define it? How do you actually set the agenda of what you want to have going to be looking like? So I think the first point, the major challenge is how to define e-health and what we do we actually need out of technology to become. Um, then comes the third part, which is the, the, the most important part, as mentioned, is uh, you know, implementation. And there's the execution is a huge, huge challenge to us. Um, technologies um, you know, tend to be as, as fast moving, as, as was mentioned by our um, eminent speaker, um, Mr. Edler says, that by the time you teach something to the students, by the time they graduate, it's already obsolete. And the same thing happens by the time we start procuring a, server, you know, a device, but, you know, the, the, the government, especially being in government, I'm talking from a company, even, you know, even companies' um, point of view, you want to make the best out of your buck. By the time we try to go through the procurement cycle, we get to the purchase it, the technology is already half of city, if you want to call it. So how do you actually uh, negotiate through the maze of implementation um, of, of such big um, projects, multi-million, multi-billion dollars sometimes, projects that you have to be able to envisage what the future is going to look like. So when you get there uh, through your procurement cycle, or, or um, uh, it's it's already um, you know meeting your needs and demands. Um, another challenge is the um, um, what mentioned by Dr. Hassa this morning was the achievements you do through your cycles. Now the society is much very much aware of what's going on in, 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 in the tech world. The um, uh, and the more successful you are is what you. Um, um, achieve in your um, sector, uh, the people become more demanding. So they say, okay, we need this. We, ha we know that that exists in some other countries, and why don't you do it? And you're dependent, uh, as I said, on a set of um, um, rules and regulations that you can't you know, really move that easily from. Uh, that, uh, that demand cannot be sometimes met, and so the, the, the unmet um, demands of the population and, and the, the knowledge that everybody has through just basically Googling whatever they think uh, is best for them, and coming to the physician say, this exists, why don't you give it to me? So actually meeting that part of the, the equation is also a, a big challenge. I think, and, and overall, if we set our targets as high as possible um, through what exists now, by the time we get there, even if we meet you know, the 80% or 70% of that target, I think it would be a very good achievement. But the challenge is putting that vision together. We, and including myself, I think we blamed, we had um, exercise that our, our colleagues in the ICT had to put together an e-health vision, and Dr. you know, her Excellency Dr. Hassan remembers that we started that you know um, exercise quite a while back from 2009, but we haven't achieved quite a bit of it. I'm really pleased to see it, like you know, the policy actions that in, in, in the broadband um, strategy 2. was it 4.2, 4.3, 4, 4.4 is specific to e-health, but then we are included in so many places, and I think if we push that agenda, although not easy, I think. It'd be the one of the best ways to to um, to um, defeat that challenge. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fadah. Um, I, have, I have a few questions for you that I'll save for a while. Um, Vishnu, if you can please give your uh, opening remarks, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I will try to give an outside-in view, as I'm coming from Consumer Insights, to give you a perspective from the user perspective. Um, uh, in Ericsson, of course, you know, we fundamentally we understand the link between broadband and the impact it has on economic growth. Uh, previous studies have shown from Ericsson that every thousand broadband uh, connections in a country, in our research, you know, it creates 80 new jobs. 
and every 10% increment increase in penetration has an effect of 1% on GDP. Uh, if we look at some research that we've done globally around some 25 global cities and 11 here in the MENA region, uh, Doha, for example, you know, we look at really from a social economic perspective, a social perspective, the impact on economic, measuring those economic benefits, uh, uh, as, as well as environmental benefits. Um, Doha, of course, from <coughs> an ICT now, we're talking not just broadband, if we look at ICT overall, um, the maturity level is quite high, reasonably high maturity level compared to, to many markets. However, the challenge is when it comes to leveraging that into benefits is, uh, is of where it falls a little bit behind compared to other cities. So really to capitalize on the investment that service providers and government organizations have made in ICT infrastructure, uh, there is an opportunity for Qatar to of course become a hub in the world to disrupt many of the different countries uh, based on different perspectives is really to capitalize and leverage that investment. Specifically, it mostly revolves around, the barriers revolves around ICT literacy, quality of local content, uh, uh, of course, language barriers, are really some of the issues that need to be addressed from a user perspective. We heard a little bit about today about the importance of public and private partnership and how important that is. For really, for Qatar to really take on, as we've seen with coming up in the 2022, these kinds of world-class events will of course bring a lot of benefits to citizens. But what will even drive more of when it comes to much smarter solutions to propel uh, the country much further is to look at how to address from a citizen perspective innovation being much more open, uh, providing benefits and, uh, for people to be able to access and to be able to create that environment of open and collaboration so you can drive the innovation in the marketplace here in Qatar. Of course, policy is extremely important, but let, let's not underestimate when it comes to uh, the demand side and the adoption side to, play, to how we can all together drive that development for Qatar. Thank you, Vishnu. Um, Mr. Khalid, please, your opening remarks. Salam alaikum. Well, one of the challenges I face in this domain is people look upon specialists like us that we are the showstoppers of innovation, which is not true, and I'll explain why. Now, what we have seen is that we have lots of, you know, advanced technology being introduced in our societies. What happens is that, you know, the, the industry builds those technologies and give it to us and then tell the security people, come and secure. You know, and that's a challenge for us because we believe that information security or privacy control should be at a very fundamental level. This is when you're basically in the requirement phase. Now, one thing I can also share with you is basically, you know, the challenges we face in broadband adoption, I think uh, I can speak about the GCC, this process. How frequently we assess our processes here? Because if you have a very effective, mature process, that process will interpret in a system or a solution, and that solution will cater to your business needs. One of the challenges we see, or I personally see actually in this region is always about process optimization. 
How many of you have done process optimization in your organization? Show of hands. Excellent. Only a few hands. And the rest, shy to say. <laughs> process and policy. You know, how process and policies are related and how really they affect our behavior when it comes to people. You know, if you have the right policies in place, okay, which is again, if you think about it, policies are basically process. You know, they're trying to actually address a challenge with the process, reflecting in a policy and coming up with new actually, you know, rules to apply. That's how, you know, the relation is between process and policy. Sometimes, okay, we always think about policies, okay, and for some reason neglect, you know, what's happening in our organization. We try to adopt best practices without actually understanding the challenges of our organizations. And when you bring those best practices, okay, without, you know, doing a further analysis, you know, further study actually about your challenges, especially projects, okay, what happens, okay, there is always a vacuum. There is lack of adoption, lack of compliance, okay, and worse, what makes us worse, you have auditors coming and checking basically, you know, your process sheets or basically your compliance measures and they're basically, you know, they're flagging the, the issues but nobody's following the issues or nobody's actually, you know, applying the corrective measures. Why? Because those corrective measures are outdated, not up to date. Thank you. Thank you, Khalid. Um, last but not least, uh, Engineer Yasser, please, your opening remarks. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first of all, thank you for this uh, kind invitation to be part of this uh, uh, conference and uh, to give me the opportunity to share uh, with the audience about uh, the progress and the plans that has been taken uh, so far from uh, Qatar 2020 uh, to Supreme Committee, which I will uh, touch on uh, later on in this panel. I just want to highlight that uh, the event of uh, Qatar 2022, uh, it's not a one-month event. It's much bigger than that. It's, it's uh, not about building a stadium. It's uh, all about having a lasting legacy for this nation and for the uh, uh, countries around uh, Qatar. It's, uh, we, we always look into the uh, event as the catalyst uh, toward achieving uh, 2030 vision where all the uh, stakeholders uh, in Qatar works together to achieve that uh, target. Uh, also, I would like later on, as I said, to, to mention more about uh, what we're looking for from, uh, from uh, the stakeholders here in Qatar to, to achieve that uh, vision. And uh, I would like to make it short. Uh, thank, thank, thank you, Engineer Yes. Um, great. Well, th thank, thank you to all our panelists. I, I want to go through a, a couple of questions. Uh, to each of each and every one of you, um, and I'll, I'll do this on, on a one by one basis. We'll start with uh, with Karis. Um, you, we're, we're very familiar that you know there's there's more and more applications that require the collection of, of, of location data um, for them to function. From from a regulatory perspective, what do you think regulators need to do to address these various privacy issues? arising from the use of, of, of such location data um, to, to enable its effective use, um, but also, uh, more, more importantly, to protect the, uh, the individual's privacy? Yes, well, as you say, location data um, can be very helpful to us because if we want to use an app that gets us a map to get home in the evening or in the UK, we're always interested in the weather, so we want to know where we are, what the weather's going to be like. Um, or you want to, um, to find out information in the locality. You come to a particular area and you want to know where there is a coffee shop. Um, all of these things are very useful. Um, but you're absolutely right, it brings privacy challenges, particularly because we're unaware a lot of the time as to how that information is being used. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, app developers develop uh, with very smart technology that can collect a lot more information than perhaps is needed. Um, and that brings its benefits, but it also brings its challenges to privacy. So location data has been seen as information that is just so personal because it tells us, tells people, tells other people where we are, and as I said earlier, can even tell people where we're going to go. Um, and that, that can be a real privacy risk to people. Um, it also, over a period of time, uh, shows 
your, um, your particular practices as to where you tend to go, so it shows your behavioural um, responses. Uh, that can be very, very valuable to, um, to advertisers. So, um, for example, Starbucks, um, if you sign up to one of their apps, as soon as you walk into an area where they have a coffee shop, then they'll alert you and they may send you uh, a voucher to have a, a discounted coffee. Helpful, but do you realise that they're actually processing your data? So, as I say, it's, it's a particular uh, hot issue at the moment. Um, and again, the, uh, the European Commission has been considering it, uh, the US has been considering it, and generally around the world, it's been seen as perhaps a special sort of data that we need to look at. And it sort of almost verges on the sensitive data because it can give away sensitive data. So again, if you can track where I'm going, you might know that I've gone to the doctor, I've gone to the hospital. Uh, it can reveal a lot of information. So. Taking the um, approach of both uh, the Commission, uh, the US and more broadly, people are drilling down to a level of privacy which effectively is saying you need to be totally, totally transparent. You cannot have a click install app which immediately puts a tracker on you. You need to be clear with people and as I mentioned earlier, at the granular level of exactly what data you're going to collect what you're going to do with it, how are you going to store it, is it only going to be used on that individual's device or is it actually being transmitted to, to other areas, how long is it going to be kept, is it just for the instant um, particular application that uh, you're using or is it going to be stored for a longer period and as I mentioned being used for behavioural purposes. So what is being called for is um, a more stringent approach to this transparency, making sure that people are aware, making sure they're very specifically aware, um, and getting consent, uh, making sure that you can't actually just assume consent. Um, what is also very helpful is um, in the US, looking at it at a practical level, um, of course a lot of this is being used on quite small screens, if you're looking at your apps there. So it's very important to have a privacy policy, but again, it's recognised that you can't put that on, on a screen. So a layered approach, in the same way as we've seen online generally, um, is called for. So there's an instant um, indication to people that you're taking their data, but then they can drill through to a more detailed um, policy if they want to, to learn about that. What I found particularly interesting, that um, in the US they're suggesting the use of um, icons, so in the same way as perhaps we're familiar with in the food industry, uh, with labelling, so we can see very quickly um, what um, food additives there are, calories in products. They're suggesting that this might be used, we're all used to icons uh, on our smart smartphones, and this would be another way of very clearly uh, identifying for people that their, uh, their uh, location data was being taken and giving them very clear options um, to effectively not opt in or to switch off that data, uh, which all in turn uh, creates a, a much more secure uh, system for, for privacy. Th thank you, Karis. Um, I'm actually probably going to reformat this and go through a question each, um, and then and then based on time we'll, we'll, we'll come back, but thank you for that, Karis. D Dr. Fale, um jumping into the, the healthcare space, um, you know, from both a Supreme Council of Health as well as uh, your, your other hat, the National Health Insurance Company, um, your perspectives on privacy, security of, of personal health records um, as you're embarking on e-health and the development of the e-health strategy, you know, the, the adoption issues is critically, you know, is truly a very important aspect of all this um, to increase adoption, um, either from the from the patient side as well as the the provider side. Um, your, your thoughts on that, please. Okay, um, privacy. Privacy is a big issue. I mean, I remember, I think it was 1982 um, when I uh, graduated high school and I went to, um, to my dad, um, God bless his soul. He, um, uh, he said, so I got scored enough to get a scholarship, so I put my scholarship forward to, to, to the Minister of Education at the time and he told me, so what did you um, want? I said, I want to, be, you know, to do and study computer engineering. And he looked at me and said, what's a computer? And at the time, he was one of the, um, um, the direct, uh, you know, directorship level in one of the major ministries in, in, uh, in the country. So the concept of, of you know, what the future looks like wasn't there. 
And I'm saying that date for particularly because there's a law of, uh, that the same year that was enacted in 1982 that governs the work of the practitioners in, in, in the health sector and also how the facilities are regulated. So the regulation of practic you know, um, uh, practitioners and, and, uh, came out and, and facilities came out in, in 1982 and those laws are still until now in effect. Laws tend not to, f tend to, not to be as fast moving as, as technology is. And we have an issue regarding um, um, how to basically regulate that environment. I have started then uh, with my team um, um, to work on what I'm, you know, as a project we could, I'm, I'm calling the Health uh, Data Protection Act, if you want to call it. That's the closest term, you know, um, translation to it in English. And basically means how, you know, how um, the health data is collected, um, by whom, where, how is it stored, how is it transmitted, and for how long it's kept, who has access to it for um, you know, access level and sort of those sort of things. And I'm saying an act, because part of this is going to be of course electronic storage, so electronic use, how we're going to collect it and store it and, and, and transmit it and so forth electronically as much as paper, same side. Of course we all aspire to the, the, the paperless environment, but I think as you know from, from uh, your knowledge that it hasn't been achieved anywhere, very, very much limited uh, success. Um, so the aspiration is there, but back again, you know, the implementation is difficult. So we're working on that part, and it's going to be really, really important to do it as soon as possible for, for several reasons. Um, um, the, the aim of my aim of, uh, out of um, the, the e health strategy is to have at the end one big repository of information where um, anybody can get access to depending on the level of the need and the use uh, or um, access. So whether it's the, um, uh, the patient who wants to, to access his records and, and you know, take, them, take them with them wherever they go or it's the researcher who wants to get um, information for research to conduct the policy maker to understand, you know, I'm using it for um, um, uh, MIS uh, purpose and so forth. So ha to go that way and had not have uh, basically the regulatory environment to control it is going to be really difficult, both from getting actually access to that data because a lot of people will have their own environment of regulations that says, no, you can't get actually access to that. And at the same time, then um, going forward with how you actually control that um, and, 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 and privacy information is extremely important and very sensitive, as you know, at the level of, of, of um, and the, both the user and, and the provider of services. So very, very keen at the moment to start you know, pushing that agenda as soon as possible. And, and I'm really glad to see that as Project 4.2 is also aiming at that. So we're going to work with our colleagues in MICT towards it. Thank, thank you, Dr. Fadeh. Um, Vishnu, um, a question, question for you with, with respect to uh, digitally connected lifestyles. So what, what's your opinion on, on how important a, a digitally connected lifestyle is um, and, and what impact does that have on consumer behaviors here in, in the state of Qatar? Good question. Um, and I think a little bit about uh, a Canadian philosopher, if you're familiar with Marshall McLuhan. Marshall said, uh, we have what we behold, we shape our tools, and then our tools shape us. Um, here uh, in, in Qatar, we've just done some recent uh, research. And if you will indulge me for a second, I'd like to share with you uh, one, uh, one of the slides of some, some output talking really about the digital lifestyle and uh, change behavior. Um, if I could get the next slide, please, yes. Um, when you look into really the, and this is based on Qatar, of course, some 2,000 quantitative interviews. Uh, when you look into the data, you can see that uh, really this is very much about empowered individuals. Uh, people, this increasingness, uh, this increased openness and sharing where you have 40% of people, of course, uh, posting information every day, where you have about 37% uh, of people uh, believing in, in virtual interactions. Uh, for you and I, some of us, we probably value a face-to-face -face interaction more so than a virtual interaction. Uh, here you can see that, of course, uh, connectivity in all aspects, uh, whether it's mobile, uh, having access to services, 
is extremely important, 52% of people, uh, it's important to be able to access the internet wherever I am. And then the last aspect is really about the importance of the digital appearance. You know, 50% of people saying that really it's, you know, online-based services is extremely important to modern day life here in, in, in Qatar. So what really does this mean? I mean, one, a couple of key things. You've heard the term about digital natives, and, and of course, these are the generation that are growing up. Uh, you know, they cannot, they cannot imagine a world without a mobile phone or internet at the fingertips. You see the smartphone explosion and, and the different kinds of devices here uh, that we have uh, here in Qatar, the, the high penetration of devices. But the digital natives as such, they are having, uh, I mean, they just can't imagine life. They're always constantly connected uh, to their networks, their tribes, and that's very important. Why? My son is 10 years old. In 10 years, or 11 years, or 12 years, he'll make his way into the workforce. He's a kid that knows about iPads and smartphones and uh, wireless and, and being connected constantly. The impact that that will have on the workforce will be tremendous because he's such an empowered individual. It's the same for that will happen in Qatar with the digital natives. When they enter into the workforce, they have a very different perspective. They will, they will of course, challenge traditional ideas. They will challenge authority. And it's going to be a balance of your experience in your company if you want to attract this kind of talent to foster innovation. You're going to have to balance your experience, your knowledge, where you came from, and of course, taken into the aspects of digital natives entering into the, into the workforce. And that's an important aspect to keep at the back of your mind as you propel, as you look at how Qatar is going forward into the future, how you manage these digital natives into the, into the workforce. Vishnu, I, I, I know that I, uh, I said one question um, and then I'll do, but I'm, I'm eager, you know, I, I just need to ask, ask this one question. With respect to your opinion on the broadband plan and its alignment to the demand um, or the demands or customer demands in Qatar, um, since you already start, started talking about, about customer demands and, and trends there, can you please give us your point of view on that? Um, yes, uh, when it comes to the national broadband plan, I mean, of course, when we look into our analysis and the research that we've done here in Qatar, I'll show you a couple more slides and some data points really to address the demand side as well as the supply side. These are key aspects that I talk about. If I go to the next slide, if you see, for example, technology as the next slide comes up, it's important first to understand the needs. And what are the needs here in Qatar? And we're just, we have a very diverse, when it comes to the population itself, you have a small population of, of, of locals, we have a huge transient expatriate population, and it's important to understand those needs and how technology can fulfill on those needs. So the different groups of people, of course, if you, if you look at an expatriate, how could technology fulfill in the areas of keeping that connection, that belongingness to my family. What can technology do to fulfill those needs? How does it fulfill the needs of my aspirations for my, for my children growing up in the society and the future? How do I feel when I do get connectivity? How, are, how can I address those needs when it comes to self-gratification, when it comes to belongingness, when it comes to, of course, looking to the future and having personal development. These are the needs that we need to consider if we want to, when we look at the outside in view from the consumer perspective. And making small changes to the way we communicate and we use the internet. I mean, if you think about the internet, the things that we see today is a result of IP. We're, con we're communicating, this connectivity is all a result of IP. So the first step is to understand the needs and address the needs of the consumers. 
The next, we can, I can show you some numbers around when it comes to, and this aligns when you look into the broadband plan, really what are the barriers to broadband adoption. It is a lack of awareness, it, are, it is issues around security, and it is issues around the language. So you can see some of the examples from the quotations from the focus groups. You know, you know in Arabic, www doesn't really exist uh, for me, so that's a challenge. You see, other, you see other quotations here around, you know, security issues where impersonation is an extremely uh, an issue. And a, a society with social norms like we have in Qatar, it's very important to address. The lack of awareness, ICT awareness, is also a challenge. 18% of people, as you see, internet users, doing purchases online. So there's a huge potential, for example, for e-commerce, but the challenges around education and awareness to address them for Qatar. The last thing I would say in the next slide, while we're in this topic of bar barriers and drivers, uh, looking into one example here around broadband as such. When it comes to, well, what's really driving the experience for fixed broadband? As I, look, I think about the focus groups that I observed here in, in, in Doha, you know, the current experience for people when it comes to fixed broadband is that it's slow, uh, people have a belief in the future around fiber and believe that that will satisfy their needs. But if we look at the current experience, today some of the issues are around complaint resolution, if you look at this piece of analysis, and then of course the value for money, the cost, what people actually pay and what they get in return for that investment does not meet their expectations. So these are the things that yes, we, uh, policies address one aspect, but we also need to look as an industry how we, can ex how we can address other issues in the areas around the demand and the supply side for the connectivity for ICT here in Qatar. Thank you, thank you Vishnu. Mr. Khalid, um, I want to move into the topic of, of supply chain, um, supply chain security. Um, as it's a very important uh, component that refers to the efforts um, to obviously enhance the overall security of supply chain. Um, wh what is your perspective on how we can actually ensure that broadband providers are in conformance with um, such applicable security measures? Um, and what, in your opinion, is, is the, the applicable measure there? First of all, I and mean, it's not fair, I'm getting the tough questions. We agree that ICT will get the easy questions. <laughs> but. Let me share with you actually supply, and because uh, Mr. Vishnu and also uh, Kerry, she mentioned about supply and privacy and controls and how we can control all that. I will share with you a movie I saw 15 years ago. It's what, about cloning, because 15 years ago, cloning was actually a new concept. You know, there was a guy in this movie who was really, let's say, overwhelmed with family demands, social demands, kids, you know, so he decided to visit a doctor and clone himself. The first clone was perfect, probably better than the original. The second clone was some deficiencies. The fourth clone was a nutcase. Now, why I'm using this, I'm trying to explain and move you to basically reality now. What happens? How many of us we depend actually on suppliers and outsource our basically some of our business operation? Come on guys, show of hands. I think most of us, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I think most of us we rely actually on suppliers and we outsource our business operation. What happens when you supply, when basically when you depend on suppliers, when you outsource, what happens? How frequently basically we assess, you know, again, the operation on the supply chain. How frequently we, we do evaluation on, you know, I'm talking fast or talking slow? <laughs> How frequently we evaluate actually the controls of the supply chain? I don't know if we do it, but reality check, we don't do it. 
And that's one of the issues, basically, when it comes to also you know, technology adoption and broadband adoption. Now, what is the solution? The supply chain is as good as you, meaning if you have a strong compliance mechanism in your organization, if you have a strong, let's say, a sufficient or efficient risk management in a solution or mechanism in your organization, that will reflect on the supply chain. If you don't have these measures, if you don't have a, let's say again, an efficient information security program in your organization, compliance and risk, it will not reflect on the supply chain. So this is the challenge. How to address it? Make sure the controls you're applying in your organization is reflected on the supply chain. Make sure you do those external you know, assessments of the supply chain. Make sure that you have, you know, you do the site visits, you do the testing, the quality assurance testing. We don't do quality assurance testing. One of the most effective industry, I personally, you know, had the, let's say, opportunity to work with, with the satellite industry. Why? Okay, Anthony, I know you're smiling. <laughs> Because in the satellite industry, I realize you know, quality assurance and assessments happening at the requirement phase. People in the satellite industry really focus on testing, 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 integration testing, stress testing. Because what happens, you go after three years of manufacturing or two years of manufacturing that satellite, they cannot have access to it once the satellite is in space. That satellite must provide service for almost 15 or 16 years. So that's why quality assurance and supply chain management is very effective in the satellite industry. And I wish we can really, you know, learn from that industry in the broadband or the network industry. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Khalid. Um, and and um, before, before we get to uh, Engineer Yasser, how many sports fans do we have here? Or football fans? Soccer fans from for North America, excellent. Um, I'm I'm personally very excited, and, and be, before um, you know, just a general question here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm eager to, and I'm sure the audience is eager to really know what what you and and, and your colleagues have been doing for the past uh, three years or, or so, and and in conjunction with that, what is your opinion on the role of of information communication technologies, broadband, with with respect to the impact of that on on the various stadiums stadiums. Uh, since the award for Qatar to host uh, the World Cup back in December 2010, <coughs> many steps has been, uh, have been taken to ensure a successful delivery of the event. Uh, I will start with uh, the establishment of uh, the Supreme Committee Qatar 2022 by an Amiri degree back in April 2011. Uh, the mandate of the organization is to ensure that uh, uh, all stakeholders know exactly what they are uh, supposed to deliver uh, for, for this event. And we have it in three uh, uh, main areas. A competition venue, which includes the stadiums and the training site, has a direct responsibility for uh, the Supreme Committee to, to, start, uh, to ensure that delivery from uh, starting of the design all the way to the uh, construction and handing over that to the local organization committee, which will come in place by 2015. And uh, the second uh, mandate is around the non-competition venues, include the accommodation for the FIFA, for the teams, and for fans. Also include the uh, IBC and uh, the fan zones. And our role as a Supreme Committee for uh, uh, this area is to ensure uh, that our stakeholders deliver uh, this uh, specification according to our plan and according to our uh, re requirements. Uh, the third uh, element uh, around that is the infrastructure, which includes uh, Qatar rail projects, uh, expressways that's been delivered by uh, Ashgal. Uh, ICT uh, play a, a major role in that. Uh, uh, also the port and the airport. And again, our role in that, again, is to, to ensure, uh, to monitor the progress and to ensure a proper delivery of these uh, projects. What we have done uh, in the last uh, couple of years is we have established what we call a baseline book. Includes all of these projects, the scope, uh, the budget, uh, the timeline, uh, the risks, and who's doing what. And we have shared that with uh, uh, our board and our stakeholders and to, to, to give them an idea of uh, how a successful uh, World Cup uh, will look like. 
and we are in, in uh, uh, currently in, uh, in a stage where we are reviewing that uh, baseline and we will share it again with our uh, stakeholders. Uh, I will go back to the core business which is delivering stadiums. Uh, as of uh, today we have uh, up to six stadiums in different stage of uh, design. Uh, these stadiums are Al Wakra and Al Khor, uh, Qatar Foundation, uh, uh, Khalifa Stadiums, Al Rayyan, and uh, the Iconic Stadium, which is going to host uh, the opening and final ceremony in uh, Lucille City. As I said, all of these stadiums are in, dif uh, in different uh, stage of uh, design, and hopefully by next year, uh, action will be uh, seen uh, on the ground. Construction will start in uh, five of them uh, around enabling work, uh, piling, and uh, early packages. Main contractors will be on the ground uh, toward the end uh, of the year. Our aim is uh, to ensure the delivery of these stadiums uh, by 2020 uh, in order for us to be ready for the Confederation Cup by 2021. One important element that we have in mind as part of uh, Supreme Committee is legacy. As I highlighted in, in my remark uh, at the beginning, it's, uh, we, uh, legacy is always uh, what we are uh, planning to, uh, to have uh, post-2022. So we have established a legacy committee uh, early uh, 2013, and uh, they are, uh, they ha we have representatives from different agencies in Qatar, and the main role of the legacy committee is to ensure that we have uh, proper planning for these stadiums uh, beyond uh, the event. And they are uh, part of the gate approval stages that we have, so we don't move into the next stage of the design unless we get the approval from the legacy committee to, uh, for them to make sure that they, we have a plan uh, what's needed uh, for these stadiums as uh, post use, as exa uh, for example, to have, for example, in Wakra, we're going to have schools, we're going to have uh, one school, and we're going to have a hotel and a community market uh, around the master uh, plan. Uh, to go back to your questions about uh, ICT, I think uh, the main the main show uh, will be uh, the football, not not ICT. Sorry to say that, but uh, uh, but we are planning and preparing ourselves to ensure that uh, all of the right infrastructure, uh, technology infrastructure, are in place for this uh, event, such uh, wi such as uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, electronic ticketing and uh, real-time information uh, coming to your device. But after what I've heard from Richard uh, earlier uh, today, it's, it's, it's going to make your life easier to use this technology, but it's going to make mine uh, very difficult because we are in a stage where we are designing uh, these venues. So we have to design and build these venues in, in, in a way that they're going to be flexible. Uh, to accommodate uh, such uh, uh, technologies because as we know that these technologies do not exist today. So we have to plan for those uh, up front. Uh, basically we are uh, future uh, proof uh, venues ag against emerging uh, technologies. Just to add to engineer Yasser, I mean I will probably you know receive nightmares <laughs> because from all the technologies and, and you know, you need to you have the challenge basically to provide, and my challenge is gonna to make sure that everything is, you know, properly, safely delivered. Definitely. So it's gonna be nightmares. Yes, definitely. <laughs> but we are up yeah. for the challenge. Just wanna th thank you all for, for for those remarks. I think we're actually uh, running run out of time. Um, but just in terms of closing remarks, um, you know, it was, it's, it's clear that every, each and every um, industry that, that we deal with um, has specific challenges that are, that are you know, specific to the actual industry, whether we're talking about patient privacy um, from, from a healthcare perspective or, or other industries or the supply chain aspect, um, different demands, different types of consumer bases. It's, it's, it's critical that we understand the various consumers the various needs, what drives them to, to adopt these various technologies and address each and every one of those um, from a different perspective. So without further ado, thank, thank you to, to each and every one of our panelists. Um, it's, it's been a true pleasure.